about Jesus Christ already in, in the United States. A lot of people know that he was that he was died on the cross, he's buried, he rose again from the dead, which obviously that's extremely important, but thankfully we live in a in a in a time and in a place where a lot of people have heard that story. A lot of people have already heard about Jesus Christ. You know, obviously we need to go over that and make sure they understand that Jesus was God and stuff like that. But this is scripture that you can use to help people to, you know, the Bible says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That's what the Bible says the requirement is for salvation. It's not church. It's not, you know, all these other things people believe in. It doesn't say any of that. It just says to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Very, very powerful verse, uh, scripture to, to use out soul winning. And then, of course, uh, if you can memorize all these scriptures and quote them word perfect, then you will earn yourself a prize as well. And then the Soul Winning Marathon is coming up Saturday, August 16th. Faithful Word's going to be driving up here, and, and I think, from, from what I understand, there should be at least 20 people coming up, which is great. I mean, that's, that's 10 groups outside of what, of what we're going to have here. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. So, and... and the early count, too, is that I think at least 10 people plan on staying the night for service the next day. So that's going to be cool, too. Um, I'm going to get a list of the names and stuff to see who, who we might have set up by, at your place. But um, I'm gonna, we're going to find out who's coming up and uh, get that all squared away pretty soon in the coming up weeks. But that is going to be... Uh, it, should be a lot, it should be really good for our church. I added it to the prayer list. It's right at the top, the Soul Winning Marathon. So please remember to keep this in your prayers. It is important. Um, pray in advance. God's going to guide us, lead us, that he'll work it out, that the right people will be home when we come to their doors. You know, God knows the beginning from the end. He knows the way things are going to happen. He, could, he has done this in the past, and it's, it's really cool when you look back and see how it works. But just pray that, that he'll, just, he'll work it out for us and that people will be home, the right people will be home, whether if they need to be home by themselves so there's no distractions, pray that that will be the case, that there's not going to be any barking dogs or what, anything that could come along to screw up somebody getting saved. Um, you know, just, just think about these things and pray for that, especially for this specific day. We're going to have so many people out. Pray that God just, fill, just, just lays out and pours out His Spirit on us. And that we are just endued with power from on high and with boldness. And that we can just go out and preach his word and, and just see a lot of great results from this effort. So, so please keep that in your prayers. I'm expecting a great day out of this and, and hoping to get some, some visitors, some people to come to church. And um, this is definitely something we need to grow. Is, is the more people out there souling, the better it's going to be. So please, please, please remember to keep that in your prayers. And... That's about it for announcements. I don't think there's anything else that we have to, to discuss this morning. So let's go ahead and turn to our next song. Let's turn to song 143, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, song 143. Song 143, Blessed Assurance. Song 143, let's sing out that first verse. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. 
This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. All right, this time I'll pass the offering plate around. And while that plate's going around, let's turn our Bibles to Revelation chapter number 3. Revelation chapter number 3. Well, one thing I did forget to mention in the announcements this morning, we, um, I went down on Friday down to Phoenix for work, and then afterwards, um, Pastor Anderson and Paul Wittenberger were there. Uh, I met up with them, and they conducted an interview with me on the new film that they're producing called Marching to Zion. And uh, it's about the Zionist movement, and um, it's really going to be a powerful documentary. I, I know I've heard quite a bit about it now. Um, they've interviewed four rabbis. And um, it's basically becoming straight from the horse's mouth. I mean, straight from these guys, how wicked, how extremely wicked and deceitful their, their religion is, Judaism. And, um, and it should open up the eyes of a lot of Christians that are just, blindly putting their faith in supporting Israel, supporting Israel, oh, we got to support Israel. I mean, that is all throughout Christian churches in America. And um, it should be a very, 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 very eye-opening, powerful fi um, film that they're making. Um, there's a lot of things they were talking about that I didn't know anything about. So again, I'm excited for this one. I learn something new every single time they release these documentaries. And it's, and it's really interesting stuff, too. So um, pray for that, too. That's, that's not in the notes, but... Um, just pray that God's going to use that. He's already worked things out. They were telling me about the footage that they got with, with these guys they were talking to and just that it's amazing. Like, amazing that they're saying all of these things and are just coming out and saying it and they are allowed them to record it, you know. Um, I don't think they realize what the, <laughs> what the film is really going to be about, but they agreed to do these interviews and, and, you know, it's not like they were deceitful or anything, but it's just... Uh, you know, when they see, when, when these guys see what the film is showing, I don't think they're going to be very happy with it. But it is what it is. I mean, they're saying these things, and this is what they really believe. It's not, it's not going to be twisting or lying about it at all. I mean, this is, it just could be showing this is what they're all about. So, um, they sh I mean, they really shouldn't be angry with it because that, they're the ones that are saying what they believe. And it's just going to be shown in the movie. Um, that, and he's got a bunch of pastors. And that's why I, you know, I went down there and just kind of showing New Testament scriptures to show that we have replaced the children of Israel as believers, as God's chosen people, as Jews, you know, as the, as the, peop the, you know, um, the elect. And um, anyways, that's what I did on Friday. Should be really exciting. I'm looking forward to that. They're hoping to get it released by the end of the year. Uh, there's tons and tons and tons of time, work, money gets poured into these films. Um, it really is a huge effort. So again, just pray that everything goes well with that. And that being said, we're in Revelation chapter 3. I'm going to read the entire chapter as we always do. You can follow along silently. Revelation chapter number 3, starting in verse number 1. The Bible reads, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, 
and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of <clears throat> and I'll write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of All right, now in Revelation chapter three, we're going to be focusing more on that, that last part of the chapter, of course, Revelation two and three. We uh, see John's given these um, he's writing letters to seven different churches that existed at that time. And we're going to be focusing in it here on the church of Laodicea, the letter that he wrote unto them. This is a message coming straight from God under the church of Laodicea. And we see here, um, starting in verse number 14, it says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. And then in verse 19, he says, Be zealous therefore and repent. And what I'm going to be preaching about this morning is how God is a God of extremes. God is not the God of the gray area. God is not the God of, of um, you know, I hear all the time on the radio, I uh, listen to talk radio, people say, oh, well, the truth is always somewhere in the middle. No, the truth isn't always somewhere in the middle. There are things that are true and there are things that are false. Anything that is a lie, anything that's not true is false. Everything that's completely true without any lies, without any error is true. And we're going to go through a bunch of examples and some attributes of God that kind of show how extreme he is. You know, like the, in, um, you know extreme meaning all on or all off. You know, not, not any of this wishy-washy, not any of this halfway in, halfway out. And this is, what he, this is the way God feels about that. When we see here, he says, look, either be cold or be hot. If you're going to get out of church, just get out of church. If you're not going to serve God, just, just get cold. Just get out of here. Or get hot. Get on fire. Start serving God. Serve God with all of your heart. Really make it a point. Really make it a purpose. Get on board. Get completely on board. Get on ship and, and get with the program. He says, or basically just get out. I don't, what he doesn't like, though, what makes him angry is this lukewarm. People who want to have things both ways. People say, well, I want to go to church. You know, I, I don't want to not go to church, but I also want to, you know, just basically live however I want. I want to live a life of sin. I don't really care about what the Bible says, but, I, you know, I do kind of want to go. I want to do these things. God's saying here, I will spew thee out of my mouth. And this is what he's looking at too. It says in verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. So this is what he's looking at when he's judging them. He's judging this church. He's looking at this church as a whole and he's saying, okay, what works are you doing? Right? What are the works that you're doing as a church? And he's calling them lukewarm. They're not cold. It's not, they're not, it's not that they're not doing absolutely anything. They're not just showing up and leaving, right, as a church. They probably have all kinds of other activities going on. And you see this too. What happens is a lot of churches will, maybe they start off doing the soul winning. Maybe they start off reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ and doing some of these works that are extremely important. 
But then they get caught up in doing these other things and it just becomes all about these activities. And, you know, we have the basketball tournaments. We have, you know, all these other fun and games and things that are going on that are trying to, um, to bring people in. But what they're doing is they're not doing the good works. I mean, they're not doing the works that God has told them to do. They might be doing, you know, keeping themselves busy doing all kinds of other things. So they're doing works, but, but their works, they're lukewarm. And the Bible says that God wants to spew them out of his mouth. He wants to have nothing to do with that. It makes him sick enough to just, I mean, think about that. Just, that's, a, that's a pretty um, vivid description. I will spew thee out of my mouth. God just takes, it's like taking a drink. You expect to have like a nice, uh, a nice cold glass of water. And then, you know, it's lukewarm. It's like, and you spit it out of your mouth. Or you're expecting a hot bowl of soup or something. And, and um, it's, you know, it's cold or it's lukewarm. And you spit it out of your mouth. And that's what God's saying here according to the, about their works. So, God would rather you just be cold. Now, he doesn't want you to be cold, but he's, he, he definitely doesn't like this in the middle stuff. He doesn't like the half in, half out. God wants you to be on fire for him. Now, today, you know, the word extremist is real popular. You know, mainstream media has been pushing this as, as, a, as part of their psychological agenda to get to just continually hammer in extremists, extremists, extremism, extremists, extremists, extremist bad, extremists is bad. And they associate that with like people who blow up planes and, and people who do these ter like truly terrorist acts. And, but they'll always say, oh, you're extremists, you're extremists. So that they just, basically what they're doing is they're redefining the word in people's minds into thinking that, well, if you're an extremist, you're automatically evil, you're bad, you're wicked, you're, you know, you're one of these guys that, that just commits violence against other people. Like that's what you are. But that's not what that word means. And we see from the Bible that, that, you know, God is a God of the extremes. And we're going to get into this a little bit more. And I'll tell you today, I'm not ashamed to say it, that I am an extremist. I believe that the Bible is the truth. And this is the only source of our truth, um, you know, that comes from God. This is the final authority. Every word of this book is true. I don't, I don't compromise my beliefs and say, oh, well, yeah, there's some errors. And, oh, well, we don't really know exactly what God has for us. Say, no, we know exactly what it is. We have the truth. It's right here. And um, I believe that we need to follow this completely, 100%. I don't think that, that God just is a God that's going to say, oh, okay, well, you know, do whatever you're going to do. It's, it's okay, whatever you do. We're under grace, so just go ahead and live however you want. No. God is a God that, that set forth these rules. And again, with the commandments, you either break them or you don't. You either follow them or you break them. I mean, there's, there's no middle ground there. You either do it or you don't. Um, <clears throat> God, uh, turn, if you would, to, um, to 2 Chronicles chapter 16. See, the world today wants to exalt tolerance, tolerance of everything. And basically, if you, if you stand for something and if you stand and say, no, this is right and this is wrong, and you can actually make a clear delineation and say, nope, this is God's law. You know, this, is, this defines our morals. This is right. This is wrong. The world likes to muddy everything up and just be like, oh, no, well, we just need to be tolerate everything, be tolerant, be accepting, be accepting of the queers, be accepting of, of fornication, be accepting of all these ungodly things. And what's, what's ironic is that the same people they claim to be, oh, well, I'm super tolerant and you need to be super tolerant too. When they find out your beliefs and when you say, no, that's not the way we should be and that... We, you know, these things are wickedness. These things are sin. Homosexuality is a sin that the Bible says is worthy of death. And these people should be stoned to death for committing their acts. Then they're going to say, you know, then you'll see how tolerant they are towards you. Yeah. Yeah. That's when their true colors come out. When you'll see how tolerant they are of your viewpoint. When it contradicts what they want to espouse and what they want to promote in their wicked agenda. You'll find out how truly tolerant they are. It's, it's... It's funny because the very things that they, that they try to claim that they are is, is the exact opposite of what they really are. It's just a disguise. They, they want to make it sound good to the public, but, but by and large, they're truly not tolerant. 
they hate and want to shut up Christianity and, and the truth in God's word. But if you're in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, see, God doesn't want us to be half in, half out. God wants us to serve him with our whole heart. He wants our heart in it. Look at um, 2 Chronicles 16, verse number 9. The Bible says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. So God is looking. He's seeking throughout the whole earth. God's eyes are open to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. God's looking for people, it says, whose heart is perfect toward him. He doesn't want people whose hearts are kind of halfway in it. He doesn't want people whose hearts are, well, yeah, you know, I go to church Sunday morning sometimes when I, when I don't have anything else going on. He's looking for people whose heart is perfect toward him. And perfect means like complete, entire, that, that we are ready to serve God with our whole heart. And having that commitment to serve God with your whole heart means you're not going to compromise. You're not going to back down. You're not going to step back from God's word. You're not going to, you know, when you're serving God with your whole heart, you're standing and founded on the rock. You're in a firm, solid ground. When you decide to get off of that, when you decide to say, well, you know, your heart starts to lead you in another way, you're not serving with a whole heart, that's when you're going to be wavering. That's when you're going to be willing to compromise. That's when you're willing to back down on what the truth really says. God wants your full attention. He doesn't want, you know, again, serving with your whole heart. He wants your full attention. God wants you to be holy, sanctified, and set apart from this world. Turn to 1 Peter chapter number 2. We're going to see this in 1 Peter chapter number 2. Again, God made his, his commandments and his laws for a reason. And God expects us to follow every single one of them. If he didn't expect us to follow and to obey his rules, then he wouldn't have a punishment for them. If he, if he, if he made them, but he's like, well, I don't really expect you to keep these, then there wouldn't be a punishment for them. And, and follow me here now, because it, sound, it might sound kind of silly or kind of funny, but um, it's, it's the truth. God expects us, the same way that I expect my children to obey everything I tell them to do. Now, just because I know that they're imperfect, because I know that they're children, and I know that they're not going to obey everything I tell them as they ought to, doesn't mean that they still shouldn't. And it doesn't mean that it's okay for them not to. There still are consequences. Now, I do know that. I know that they're not going to be perfect. I know that they're not going to listen to everything that I, that I have for them. God knows that about us. But it doesn't excuse or make it okay to not follow and to not obey His commandments. He made them for a reason. And there is a, a punishment associated with not doing those things, which is exactly why we need a Savior. For one. Because He, even though we aren't perfect. He doesn't just excuse our sin. He holds us accountable and says, no, you've broken my law. You deserve to go to hell. And that's why we need a Savior, someone that can save us from that punishment because that's what we all deserve. You're in 1 Peter chapter number 2. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dear, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. We saw there in verse 9, he says, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. This is the way that God views us. This is the way that God looks at you. He says, you're a royal priesthood. You're part of the king's priesthood. That's how important your job is, and that's why um, we have to live accordingly. God doesn't, ex God doesn't want us. He's calling us part of his royal priesthood. Do you think he wants you going out then, uh, going out to the bar on Saturday night and, and getting drunk or, or you know, doing whatever other sin and just, and just treating God and treating serving God as just maybe something you do on a Sunday morning and then the rest of your week you forget about him? If you're in that position of a royal priesthood, hey, that royal priesthood isn't something that you're a part of only on Sunday morning when you're in church. 
That's something that you are. That is something that you have become. That is a role that you have, you have fallen into the moment that you get saved. When the Holy Spirit moves inside of you, you become a part of that royal priesthood. You have become a part of that holy nation. Now, a holy nation is something that's sanctified. It's set apart. And that's why he says you're a peculiar people. We ought to be a peculiar people. Now, if you don't take things to the extreme with God, if you don't, if you don't obey His Word completely, if, you do, if you're not out there trying to do as much as possible to live your life according to every single thing that is literally written in this book to keep and to do them, then you're not going to look very peculiar to the world. The reason why we're peculiar, it says in verse 11, it says, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from flesh and lust, which war against the soul. This earth is not our home. We are strangers. We're foreigners here. When you get saved, we are looking for the new Jerusalem. We are looking for a heavenly city. That is going to be our permanent dwelling place. We're just passing through this time and this place where we are right now. This is not going to be our home. This is not our final resting place. We are pilgrims. We're strangers. Now, the world, this is their home. People who are of the world, people who are in the world that are not saved, that are just children of the world, this is their home. We're strangers. We're foreigners. And we ought to look like such to the world. We should not be conformed to this world, but we should be transformed um, through Jesus Christ, you know, to the renewing of our mind that we don't look like the world, we don't act like the world, we're actually different. Um, 1 John chapter 2, turn if you would to um, Titus chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2 verse 15, of course, real famous passage, gets preached on a lot. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. We need to avoid all worldliness. Anything that is of the world is not something that we should be. It's not something we should be a part of. Because the Bible says that all that is in the world is not of the Father. It's not from God. It's from the world. And these are the things that are in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are the things that we need to avoid and make sure that we're not being a part of that. Second, or in Titus chapter 2, look at verse number 11. Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. The Bible is teaching, you know, teaching us here that we need to deny ungodliness, worldly lusts, live soberly, righteously, godly. The world is not like that. And see, if you're doing these things, we'll just break it down real simple because the world's going to look at you and say, you're an extremist. The world's going to look at me today and say, man, you are just extreme. Because they'll see, yes, my, my daughters and my wife wear skirts. They dress like women. We don't watch television. We don't watch cable. We don't go out to the movies. We don't drink. We don't party. We don't do these things. We are abstaining from as many things of the world as we possibly can. You know, that's the way that we try to live our life soberly, righteously. Then we go out, we knock on doors, we talk to people. Say, what? You mean you actually you talk to people about the, you actually open up the Bible and try to do it? That's taboo. You can't do that. You're not supposed to talk about religion to people. Well, yes, we are. And the Bible says that we are. And that's exactly what we do. Now, you might look at it and say, oh, that's extreme. You go out for three hours a week or whatever, four hours, and, and you go out and preach the gospel, and you don't watch TV, and you, know, and you don't do all these things. The Bible says that we are to, to not be of this world and we're to be separate. People ought to be able to look at you and be like, there's, some, there's definitely something different about this person. They're a peculiar person. They're a little bit strange. Not, they don't line up with everything that the world is. We don't have all the same likes and interests that the world does. We're interested in the things of God and it should show forth in your good works and you should be zealous of good works. 
But the world's going to look at that and call you extreme. But that's what God expects. He expects you to follow him extremely close. He doesn't want you following way far back. He wants you being real close to him. Draw an eye to God and he'll draw an eye to you. God wants you as close to him as possible, as extremely close to him. Look at, um, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. If you're in uh, Titus 2, it's not too far. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it's just a little bit... <clears throat> First Thessalonians chapter number five, right before first and second Timothy, first Thessalonians chapter five. Look at verse number 14, because see, God wants you to be, the, the world's going to look at you like you're a fanatic. You're an extremist. You, I can't believe you believe every word of the Bible. Well, yes, I do. And not only do I believe it, but I'm going to try to live my life as closely as possible to that, as extremely close as I can. But if you actually try to live out the words of the Bible, we're going to see this. Look at some of these words. I love this, this chapter here, First um, Thessalonians 5. Look at, we're going to start reading in verse number 14. The Bible says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. Now I highlight some words in these verses in verse 15. It says, ever follow. That means always, always follow, ever follow that which is good. Don't take a break from it. Do it all the time. Rejoice evermore. Again, forever. Keep rejoicing. Pray without ceasing. Don't stop. I mean, that's pretty extreme, right? Pray and pray and pray and pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. Everything. Look at these words. Prove all things and abstain from all appearance of evil. Every single one. He's not saying some. He's not saying, you know, just a little bit. Everything all, all the way in. Pray without ceasing. Abstain from all appearance of evil. This is the way that God wants us to live. He wants you so sold out that you are just completely doing that which is right all the time. We should be walking. If you're walking in the spirit, the Bible says you're not, you should not obey the lust of the flesh. And that's in um, Galatians chapter 5. But um, God wants us completely on board. Extreme. All the way to the extreme. You say, like, if the if the left side of this room represents wickedness and just just the worst reprobate type of wicked you could be, and the right side of the room would represent like Jesus Christ and his and and the way that he walked on this earth, completely perfect and righteous and everything that he did. Obviously, God's going to want us. He's not going to want us right here. He doesn't want us over here. He doesn't want us over here. He wants us. He wants us right next to him. He wants us right next to Jesus Christ. Hey, that's the extreme. This is one extreme, that's the other extreme. God wants us on this extreme, as close to Him as possible. Now we're going to get some more into these, these attributes and, and kind of showing how, um, how God likes to deal in extremes. The Bible, first of all, says in Deuteronomy chapter 4, you could turn to... Um, Turn, if you would, to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The Bible describes God as a consuming fire. In Deuteronomy 4.23, the Bible says, Take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make you a graven image of the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. And in Hebrews 12, it also says the same thing. It says, for our God is a consuming fire. Now, this is, a, this is a view of God that a lot of people don't quite understand. That um, God is, we know that God is love. And that's why I probably don't preach on that, maybe even as much as I ought to. But we know that. And, and his love, and, and you know what? I ought to preach a sermon on, on God's love and mercy and, and um, I've done it before, but, but um, we, we can't overlook that. But it's just the society in general is just so imbalanced with their view of God. 
We also need to understand that he's a consuming fire. I mean, he's warning them here about making graven images and making false gods and setting up idols. Because it says God is a jealous God. Now, people today will like to use that word jealousy as if, as if it's a sin. And it's not. God is jealous. God does not want his people looking at any other God. He doesn't want you making any other idols. He doesn't want you worshiping them, bowing down to them, praying to them, doing anything else. He's the God. He deserves our respect and our attention, not some other fake, false, phony God. The same way that, you know what, I'm a jealous husband. I don't want my wife looking at other men. I don't want her talking with other men and giving other men her affection when it ought to be going to me. And it should be, it should be likewise for her. God is a jealous God in that same sense. He doesn't want us going to other gods. And that's why it says here that the Lord thy God is a consuming fire. We need to be, have a proper fear of God. That's why Hebrews 12, 28 says, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God accept acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Why do we need to be fearful of God? Why do we need to give Him reverence? Because He's a consuming fire. That's pretty extreme. That's, that's, I mean, a consuming fire is, you know, represents total destruction and wrath and anger and fury. God has that aspect to him. Now, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. We're going to talk about, you know, God created heaven and hell. Again, we talk about extremes, right? When you die, you're going to one of those places. You're not going to this purgatory. You're not just going to float around in, you know, in this earth and, and just kind of float from here to there like Casper the ghost or something, you know, you're either going to be in heaven or you're going to be in hell. Now, heaven is extremely good. It's amazing. It's, 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 it's more than we could comprehend how great heaven is going to be when we get there. But guess what? Hell is extremely bad. They are two extreme polar opposites of each other. And this is the way that God designed it. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. It says, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. He's saying we can't even understand. You know, no eye has seen this. Our ears haven't heard about it. You know, it hasn't even come into our heart what God has prepared for them that love Him. That, I mean, it's, it's so far above and beyond what we can think about, what we could expect, what we could see, what we could hear, any of this stuff. What God has prepared for them that love Him, it, He says, it's going to be amazing. And um, the Bible says in John 14, too, it says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Um, you know, we're told a mansion is an extremely large dwelling place, is it not? I mean, it's not some modest, you know, middle income, you know, house or a shack or a double wide or a single wide or anything like that. I mean, a mansion is a huge dwelling place, a huge place. You know, it's, a, it's, it's the title that's given to basically the biggest type of place that you could live in is a mansion, right? Um, it doesn't really get any bigger than that. And um, that's what God has prepared for us. It's extremely good. And we could probably get, you know, you have extreme joy, comfort, peace, no pain, no suffering, no sorrow. All these things are going to be done away. It's extremely good. And, you know, the Bible actually talks more about hell than it does about heaven. Um, turn, if you would, to Revelation 22. We're going to see one more reference to heaven. But I think what we're going to be able to see is we know that heaven and hell are, are complete opposites of each other. So the more we read about and see how bad hell is, the more we could maybe understand how good heaven will be because it's, it's going to be the exact opposite. So as bad and as horrible as hell is, is the exact opposite how, how good and how great and how joyful being in heaven will be. Um, Revelation 22, look at verse number 3. The Bible says, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Again, so more, more um, insight into what heaven's going to be like, um, 
reigning forever and ever. There's no night. We don't need any candles. We don't need any extra light. God is the light. Um, God is going to provide His light. We're going to be that close and we're going to, we're going to experience God's pure light uh, in heaven, which is going to be amazing in and of itself. And there's no curse there. And um, anyways, flip back to, to Revelation 21. 21 verse 6. Revelation 21 6 says, and he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Again, I mean, Jesus Christ. The beginning, the end, Alpha, Omega, one extreme to the other. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. This is the contrast now we're going to see of heaven, the great things, the fountain of life, getting it for free. I mean, everything about it is just, is just pure and simple and great and true. And then in verse 8 it says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So on the other extreme, on the other opposite, you have this lake of fire. On the one hand, you have heaven. You're inheriting all things. You, you, know, you could drink of the, of the fountain of life, the fountain of the water of life freely. You just go and take a drink whenever you're thirsty as opposed to being in the lake of fire where you're never going to get even a drop of water to cool your tongue. You're going to be in thirst. You're going to be in torment. You're going to be in torture forever. Two extreme opposites. We're going to read a little bit more about hell. Revelation 14. If you're in Revelation 21, just flip back to Revelation 14. We're going to see another reference describing hell in Revelation 14. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now let's talk about people who receive the mark of the beast. But this is explaining what hell is like. Anyway, it's not just specifically for those people who worship the beast. I mean, these, these aspects of hell being tormented with fire and brimstone, yeah, that's going to happen for everybody that's in hell. And the smoke of their torment ascending up forever and ever, everyone in hell, you're there forever. And that's probably the worst part about it. I mean, think about how extreme that is. God is a God of extremes. Hey, when you die without Christ, because you've sinned, you are going to burn and be tortured forever and ever, and you can never get out. That is your punishment of not receiving a free gift, of not acknowledging the Lord God that made you, of not putting your faith in Christ. This is what you get. Torture and torment for an eternity, forever. No rest day or night. And I think about this. I mean, that in itself is not even having rest is torturous. There's so many days where I only get a few hours of sleep and you think, man, you just want to sleep so bad and that desire just to get some rest. After going, especially you go days on end, you, are, you don't get very much sleep. You don't get very much sleep. All you want to do is rest and it almost feels torturous and painful to you until you can finally get that rest. Well, people who are in hell never get that rest. They never get rest. Day, night, forever and ever and ever, they go on continually being tortured with zero rest. No break. No respite. That's what they have. That is an extremely horrible situation to be in. Hey, God's the one who created that place. God created that extremely bad place, but hey, God created that extremely good place of heaven where there is no pain, there is no suffering, there is no sorrow. You do get rest. You do get, you know, you're going to enter into God's rest. This is what we get in heaven versus hell. Can you see how God is a God of the extremes? He's, I mean, he's created two things that are completely extremely opposite. This isn't just some, some thing, some middle ground. God also created light and darkness. I'm not going to go into this too much. We kind of went over this in the book of John, in John chapter 1. But, um, you know, people generally don't like extremes because they'll say, well, you're so divisive. You know, 
you can't find middle ground when you're an extremist. You're not going to be compromising your beliefs, or at least you ought not to be. If you're on the extreme of one end of an argument, you don't compromise. I mean, that's, that's what's right. And that's where we are with the Bible. Hey, this is God's word. This is the truth. I'm not going to back down on this. I'm not going to compromise on this. I'm not going to give you some legroom. We'll meet somewhere in the middle. No. I'm going to meet with you right here. You can either accept it or reject it. The choice is yours. But this is where I stand, and you're not going to move me from this. There is no middle ground. Hey, the light divides the darkness from the light. The light comes in, and it shines in, and it darks, and it separates the darkness from the light. That's what the Bible says in Genesis 1. It says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And in John chapter 3, we're going to see this this week, verse number 20 says, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. God created light and darkness, and he created that division there. And hey, some people aren't going to like this truth. And they're going to get away from it because they don't want their evil deeds to be reproved. But those that are doing good, those that are working righteousness, hey, they want, they, they love this book. They love the Bible. Yeah, shine the light on it because what I'm doing is rotten God. The works that I'm doing, hey, that's what God told me to do. So let's, let's bring this light out. Let's shine it on there. But people who are dedicated to doing wickedness and living a wicked life. They don't, they don't necessarily want this light shining on them because it's going to expose their wickedness to them. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, turn if you would to, um, <clears throat> we're almost done here. We'll wrap things up here soon. Turn if you would to Matthew chapter number 7. We see in Ephesians 5, the Bible says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. He's saying, don't, don't start having fellowship. Don't start um, you know, getting close and buddying up with, with the darkness of this world, with the unfruitful works of darkness. He's saying, but rather reprove them. Stand in the light, stand in the truth, reprove the darkness, reprove the, the, the unfruitful works of darkness. It says, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Don't even talk about it. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. <clears throat> Another example of extremes, you have good, you have evil, right? We saw light and darkness, heaven and hell, good and evil. They're two extremes. Matthew 7, uh, look down at verse number 15. This is a warning Jesus has given us about false prophets. Matthew 7, verse number 15 says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. Again, this is in reference to false prophets. This is when you're talking about, you know, when you're judging someone by their fruits, this is talking about judging a prophet. Someone who's a, a prophet, a preacher, you know, supposedly a man of God. How do you judge? That person, you judge that person by their fruits. You judge that person by their converts. Judge that person by the fruits of what they're doing with their life and their service to God. That is where you can judge those fruits. And he's, God is telling us, Jesus is telling us, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. A good tree, a good, a good, the right prophet is not going to bring forth um, a false prophet. They're not going to bring forth bad, evil fruit. But likewise, you know, a corrupt tree, a false prophet, they can't get people saved. They can't bring forth good fruit. They can't do these good things. Now, on the outward appearance, they might look like they're good, but, but ultimately they're not. I mean, Judas Iscariot was able to deceive people, but Judas Iscariot was not out getting anybody saved because a corrupt tree bring, does not bring forth good fruit. It doesn't happen. Jesus said it doesn't happen. He says, you're either a good tree or you're a corrupt tree. If you're a prophet here, he's saying, you're either one or the other. 
if you're a tree and bringing forth, hey, my apple tree isn't going to bring forth oranges. It's only going to bring forth apples ever. And the corrupt tree isn't going to start bringing forth saved Christians. It's not going to happen. They're not saved. <clears throat> the Bible says in Romans 12, verse 9, it says, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Again, two extreme opposites. He's saying abhor, that word abhor is a, is a strong word for hate. He's saying, hey, hate that which is evil. Hate it. Have nothing to do with it. Don't say, oh, I could sympathize and empathize and I know, you know all these things being evil. He said, no, hate the evil. Have nothing to do with evil. And cleave to that which is good. Hold tightly. Cling to it. Be as close as you can to that which is good. Cleave to it. Don't be somewhere in between good and evil. You need to hate as much as, you, as, as much as you're cleaving and clinging to that which is good. You need to hate with the exact opposite that which is evil. The last, uh, the last extreme to look at here is love versus hate. Now, many people today don't believe that God hates anybody. I'm going to prove that wrong. Now, first of all, God loved. The Bible says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hey, God has extreme amounts of love. And I think this is why people don't believe that God hates. It's because of the immense love that God has for us. And it's true. I mean, God has his mercy endureth forever. God has extreme mercy, extreme love, you know, and, and long-suffering. God has all of these attributes, and they're amazing, and they're great. And, and it's great to understand that, and, and we need to know that God is so loving. Like I love that God is so loving. But um, we have to understand that as loving as God is, it doesn't make Him incapable of hate. To the contrary, if you experience God's love, hey, you know what a great thing that is. But God's hate is the exact opposite. As much and as loving as God is to be willing, for Jesus Christ to be willing to endure the cross and to suffer the shame and the spitting in his face and the beating and the whipping and the torturing and being hung on a cross and people deriding him and railing on him and going through all the things that Jesus Christ went through and his soul bearing our sins, which he didn't commit, bearing these sins so that God couldn't even look upon him. And then go into hell and paying and suffering what we just saw about hell, that torture and torment and no rest day or night. All of these things to go through all of that stuff. Hey, that is extreme love. Greater love knoweth no man in this than, a, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus Christ has love that is greater than anybody. As much as God loves us, God also has hate. God has that same volume that he does for love. He has that same exact opposite within hate. Ecclesiastes 3.8 says there's a time to love and a time to hate. Ecclesiastes 3 goes through all these, you know, a time for war, time for peace, all these other things. But there's a time to love and there's a time to hate. It's not, it's not always a sin or it's not always wrong to hate, but we're going to be looking at God. People will say, oh, well, I don't believe that God hates anyone. I don't believe that God hates people. Well, what about Malachi uh, chapter 1, verse number 2 says, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord, yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. So here we see God specifically saying, I love Jacob, and I hated Esau. Now we know he's not talking about the man, the person Esau, he's talking about Edom, he's talking about his descendants, that whole nation, but... We see here God hating. I mean, it's a plain English. I hated Esau. This is attributed to God. People still, I had someone look at that and still say, well, I don't believe that God hates me. That's what the Bible says. You see, you're going to say you don't believe that God hates, then you don't believe what the Bible says. Turn, if you would, to Leviticus chapter 26. Please turn to Leviticus 26. We're almost done here. We're going to see a little into how God comes to hate people. Okay? Because it doesn't happen. Because God is long-suffering and because God is merciful, the hate doesn't just happen immediately. When God actually hates an individual or hates a person. Okay? We're going to see, if you're, you're in Leviticus 26, we're going to skip a little bit through this because just, just for sh sake of time. But 
basically in Leviticus 26, we're going to see what God's saying he's going to do. Basically, what he starts doing is saying, if you don't listen to me, this is what I'm going to do. And if you still don't listen to me, this is what I'm going to do. So look at verse number 26, verse 14. It says, but if you will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments. And then he goes on for a few verses and says, this is what I'm going to do. You know, you're know, you going to be cursed this way. You're going to be cursed this way. You're going to go through these troubles. Verse number 21 says, and if you walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sin. So he's saying, okay, I'm going to ramp things up a little bit. It's going to get even worse for you. Seven times more for your sins. Look at verse number 23. And if you will not be reformed by me by these things, but will walk contrary unto me. And again, he's given them even more things, more cursings that are going to happen in the next verses. Then in verse 27, it says, and if you will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury. Fury is extreme anger. I mean, I can't think of a, of a more powerful word than fury to describe an anger that, that's just ex extremely angry. Is fury, rage, right? In my fury... And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins, and ye shall eat the flesh of your sons, and the flesh of your daughters shall ye eat. And I will destroy your high places, and cut down your images, and cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. God's saying that he, his soul is going to hate you. I will abhor you. But look, didn't he give these people opportunity after opportunity? Now, look, they needed to be chastised and disciplined, and God's trying to deal with them and say, look, okay, you're not going to listen to me, then this is what's going to happen. Oh, you're still not going to listen to me? Okay, well, this is what's going to happen. All right, look, you're still not going to listen unto me? Now it's going to be seven times as worse. And then he says, okay, you're still not listening to me? Now I'm going to hate you. And you're going to experience my fury and my wrath. And, you know, this is how you know, a lot of people don't understand quite the, the doctrine of like people becoming reprobate and rejected by God. It's not something that happens overnight. This is something that happens over a period of time. God is merciful and long-suffering. But when you get to this point to where you just, you just don't want to have anything to do with God, and obviously God's talking to him if you're not listening He's obviously talking to them. He's saying, you won't hearken unto me. Does that mean that they're not, they're not, they, they, they have no way of knowing what God has for them to know? Of course not. If they're not listening to him, God's talking to them, right? It's not that God's not talking to them and expecting them to know. No, God's talking to them. They're just not listening. He gives them chance after chance after chance before he finally says, my soul shall abhor you. Flip back real quick to Leviticus chapter number 20. You see, you get many chances before you fall to this point where God's actually going to hate you. But I'll tell you what, when you get to the point where God hates you, watch out. Because God is a God of the extremes. Look at um, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 23. It says, And ye shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you. For they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. So he hated them. Why? Because they did all these things. Now, if you know anything about Leviticus chapter number 20, Leviticus 20 is, is the book of the law that, that teaches against bestiality and homosexuality, these extremely perverted, wicked things. And he's saying, look, they did all of these things. That's why I hated them. So I hate it because... And they don't, you don't start off in bestiality as a person. I mean, nobody just... Again, it's not something that happens overnight. People get to that point of wickedness over time of just not listening to God, getting into sin, getting into more sin, just getting into sin more, not listening to God, have nothing to do with God until they get so depraved and just, and just rejected to where they're willing to do all kinds of bizarre, crazy things. And, and it's just pure wickedness. And that's the point where God hates them. Now, we need to have this, this, this understanding that, that God is a God of the extremes. He expects us to walk right, uprightly, and perfectly before Him. We need to get our hearts set on serving Him, set on 
listening to what he has to say to us in the Bible so that we don't just, just reject him and not listen to him. Read his words. Read what he has for you to do. Don't be someone who's half in and half out of church. Don't be someone who's, who's halfway serving God. Hey, get in it with all of your heart. That's what God's looking for. God's eyes are searching to and fro, looking for people who are willing to put all of their faith, all of their trust, everything in the Lord Jesus Christ and willing to serve Him with all of their heart. Let's do that today. Let's, let's hope that God can find us as people that, that He can use to, to do some great works for him because we're willing to serve him with all of our heart and that we're not going to be people who's going to want to spit out of his mouth. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the Bible. And um, I love your characteristics, dear God. We know that, um, that even though hell is such a horrible place, we know the exact opposite of that is heaven and how wonderful and how great that's going to be, dear Lord. And... Um, as much as you hate this wickedness and the wicked sins, dear Lord, we, we can see through that hatred how much you truly love and um, will bring joy to those who, who will listen to you and, wa and walk in your steps and do the things that you've laid out for us, dear God. Um, we thank you for giving us all the information that we need in the Bible to be able to accomplish these things. Help us to, to be strong in, um, in the Spirit. Lord, help us to walk in the Spirit, to put away the lust of the flesh, dear God and um, ever to draw closer unto you that we can be extremely close to you, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.